Greetings and welcome. I love iodine with another video in my series on intestinal parasites. This video is going to cover parasites in the news. I've been putting out various videos covering articles that are released on the internet or in newspapers. And this is the second in that sub series, if you will. If you're new to my channel, I cover various topics relating to intestinal parasites. I personally was infected with a fish tapeworm and intestinal flukes. So I go into great detail about the symptoms and on various foods and herbs that can actually help deal with it and the different um, types of supplements that are very important for someone that's interested in actually you know, taking care of parasites on their own. If you suspect you may have a health condition or you suspect that you might be infected with parasites, I highly recommend seeking medical attention and actually discussing with your healthcare practitioner the possibility of being infected with parasites. As you shall see, in this video and other videos that common things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis put ourselves at risk for becoming infected. If you are someone that has a pet living inside your house, say a cat or a dog or other pet, you are at risk of acquiring different types of parasites. If you go outside, you walk barefoot, there's another risk factor. If you eat fresh fruits and vegetables that are not thoroughly washed, there's a risk factor. If you travel outside the United States, that's a risk factor. Now, even, you don't, even though traveling outside the United States to different tropical nations does put you at risk for other parasitic infections that are not known to be here, that doesn't mean that we don't have our own um, list of parasites that reside in the United States. They've always been here. They're part of Earth's growth um, and decay cycle. They help break down decaying matter, and they have been here since the beginning of time, and they will probably be here long after well, me for sure, and probably, you know, into the future. Anyway, that being said, something we need to be aware of. Also, eating pork and fish and beef is other ways we can become infected. So there are many ways that we can become infected, so we need to be aware of that, and we need to learn how we can reduce our risk. So when I go over this article, I'll be discussing ways that we can actually reduce our risk of becoming infected with fish tapeworms. This article was published in January 2017, and even though this is from CNN, this article was released on every major news agency that I was able to find. That's CBS News, US News and World Report, USA Today, and on and on. This is a report that was, or an article rather, that was based on a report that was put out by the CDC. And that was a report highlighting that this research study was going to be published in the Emerging Infectious Diseases that was going to be released February 2017. Again, this article was based on a research study that was conducted in 2013. So it took us three years to get this information. That's a little disconcerting. And if we read this article title, it says U.S. salmon may carry Japanese tapeworm scientists say. At first glance, somebody may dismiss this and think that this is only speculation, that this hasn't been proven. But if you read this article and you read the actual research study, you will find that this is not a speculation. This is a proven fact. Scientists taking 64 samples of various types of Pacific salmon and doing genetic sequencing discovered that four types of Pacific salmon including the chum salmon, the masseuse salmon, the pink salmon, and the sockeye salmon were infected with two different types of fish tapeworms. Now, we need to talk about the most common fish tapeworm, which is called Diphalobothrium latum. That has been known to be in the U.S. salmon population for decades, basically since they were able to start identifying them and actually naming them. I would expect and in my opinion, these tapeworms have been in the U.S. salmon population since the beginning of time. But again, I can't prove that because I've only lived on this earth for 40 plus years, so I can't say anything beyond that. Okay, so what we have here is that they have proven that a second type of fish tapeworm called the Japanese broad tapeworm is in fact in the U.S. salmon population. It was suspected that there was a second type of tapeworm for many years and it was not, it hadn't been able to be proven until they could actually do genetic sequencing on the actual um, samples. Anyway, that being said, let's discuss the fish tapeworms. They're very closely related, um, if you will. So the symptoms of having one are gonna be rather the same. They both grow to be about 30 feet long 
you may read reports that tapeworms can be 100 feet long. Well, if you're a well, maybe a great blue well, yes, that could be true. You're not, you're a human. So fish tapeworms and tapeworms can only really go to be about the length of your intestines. They're, you know, they have a limitation there. Um, most of the people that are infected don't have symptoms for many years. That was definitely the case for myself as well. So don't think um, you don't have a tapeworm just because you don't have any symptoms. You're not gonna know right away. It took me many years before serious symptoms started to manifest where you know, uh, started questioning and I sought medical care. Even when I did seek medical care, I was diagnosed with many different things and my doctors never ever suggested a parasitic infection as being the cause of any of those things. Uh, one thing we need to consider is even though uh, the, the parasites are causing no symptoms, and I put that in air quotes if you will, they are actually causing your body damage. They're stealing your nutrients and they're toxifying your body. And what I mean by toxifying your body is they're really, they're going to the bathroom inside you. So that's putting an undue burden on your kidneys, on your liver, and that can actually be um, expressed in your skin. Skin problems, acne, eczema, you could have dermatitis, you could have hives or rashes. And those are similar things to what I had. And my doctor, uh, my dermatologist said, oh, you have contact dermatitis. It had nothing to do with anything I was coming into contact. It was actually coming outside my body you know, from the fact that, you know, I was having a heavy burden of toxins. So anyway, keep that in mind. You may go to a doctor and they may give you this diagnosis, but you know, if you put the pieces together, you might find that there's actually a root cause that's causing a whole host of different ailments. So anyway, like I suggested at the beginning, if you suspect you may be infected with a parasite, please speak to your doctor and take this information to them and check out my other videos. I do put the links to the articles and to the CDC sites and the, the different ones that I talk about and the WHO because I want to empower people to take their health into their own hands and to be able to go to their doctor and present this. Your doctors are overworked. They're very busy. They don't necessarily have time to keep up with current research and they might be, you know, completely unaware. Maybe that their specialty you know, didn't cover this, you know, discussing parasitology. I mean, that's a whole study in itself. So it, you know, something you can maybe do to help your doctor as well. Anyway, I want to let you know that if you want to know how to reduce your risk of becoming infected with fish tapeworms, you need to know how you can get it. The main way to get it is eating raw or undercooked fish. So if you're someone that enjoys eating sushi or sashimi, smoked fish or ceviche style, you are at risk for developing a parasitic infection. I'm not trying to scare you here because there's a very easy way that you can reduce your risk to basically zero. Make sure you get it from a reputable place that knows the actual way to properly prepare it. And by that, all you have to do is freeze it. If they freeze it, according to the CDC, the guidelines are as follows. Seven days at minus four degrees Fahrenheit, which is equivalent to minus 10 degrees Celsius, will kill all the parasitic eggs and the larval cyst. If you have a freezer, like many restaurants do, that are deep freezers that actually go to a much lower temperature, the length of time that the fish can be frozen can be shorter. Check out the guidelines for more specifics. I personally make sure that I freeze my fish much, much longer. I'd rather be um, err on the side of caution, but that's just me. But again, make sure that you go to the CDC's website, go by their guidelines. I have read so many things on the internet that are just so vague that, oh, freezing it for a day will take care of everything. No, it won't. It depends what the temperature is. Yes, if you have a freezer that goes down to mud, it's 35 degrees Fahrenheit, but who has one of those in their house? So keep in mind, I think the trusted source here is the CDC or, or the WHO, rather than just some random internet site. So I'll be putting those links in this video as well, so you can actually you know take a screenshot of the CDC's guidelines if you're someone who makes fish our sushi at home so you know how to properly prepare it. Also, if you're getting it from a drugstore or a convenience store, well, good luck. I don't know how they prepare it. I, that just sounds so unappetizing, but I'm not making any judgments. I personally don't like sushi or sashimi, which is ironic because that's in fact how I became infected with a fish tapeworm. But it was a friend who suggested that I try it. and. Uh, well, I did. So anyway, keep those things in mind. I hope that this was a benefit. 
I thank you for taking the time to listen. And if you haven't subscribed and you would like to learn more about intestinal parasites, please hit the subscribe button. If you like the video, you can hit the like button. Please share it with people that um, may be able to benefit from this information. And please comment. I would love to hear what you have to say or if you have any questions. All right, thank you very much. Have a good one. Peace.